I'd like to talk a little bit today about Roxane Gay's What Fullness Is and its relation with key themes of this course. In some ways, this is where it all comes together. In this reading, we can consider cultural capital, rhetorical dexterity, and the connection between personal and public narratives. Let's start with the personal and the public. Most of us have likely been exposed to public narratives concerning weight and body image. Our society often presents obesity as a personal problem. People are blamed for their weight, even if it's a result of things they cannot control. For example, many studies show that the richer the neighborhood you come from, the less likely you are to have issues with obesity. Roxane Gay's What Fullness Is confronts the very personal decision to get bariatric weight loss surgery while also addressing the very public issues of capitalism, particularly in terms of the extreme costs related to health care, and public perceptions and representations of healthy body image. A careful reading of her text will show a masterful interweaving of the personal and the public, how perceptions of weight that are widespread have affected this individual and have influenced her decision making, not always for the better, and also how her personal financial situation affects her ability to get treatment. The first four paragraphs, for example, focus squarely on public aspects of the issue of thinness. After the break in text, Gay has us look at her own story from a personal vantage. And then she tells us, in no uncertain terms, what the loudest public narratives tell her about her own personal body. Quote, The truth is that my desire for weight loss has long been about satisfying other people more than myself, finding a way to fit more peacefully into a world that is not at all interested in accommodating a body like mine. And the dominant cultural attitude toward fatness is that the fat body is a medical problem, a drain on society, an aesthetic blight. As a fat person, I'm supposed to want to lose weight. I am supposed to be working on the problem of my body. I am supposed to apply discipline to physical unruliness. I am not supposed to be fine with my body. I am not supposed to yearn, simply, for people to let me be, see me, accept me, and treat me with dignity exactly as I am. Also, Gay is rather clear about how her weight makes her feel personally. She intermingles her experience of her body with others' experience of her body. This provides readers with a vivid sense of where the personal and the public interact. The bits about how what she loves and hates about her body are vivid illustrations of her mastery in talking about both of these ideas at once. Furthermore, she points out that her ability to get surgery is directly related to her success as a writer. The personal income she can put forth for her operation clears away a lot of red tape, and she reports on the ease with which she can get appointments once the offices know they won't be dealing with insurance companies. Think about how this engages public narratives. Gay, because of her wealth, can afford these privileges. But what about those people whose health would benefit from this surgery who can't afford it? As she puts it, quote, health care is as wantonly susceptible to the ills of capitalism as everything else, unquote. I want you to think about this relationship between personal and public when you consider where you might want to do some research. These sites where your own experience is mediated, affected, wrangled by public arguments, discussions, cultural norms and values, preconceptions and prejudices are especially useful in developing a public argument of your own. Also, in terms of rhetorical dexterity, let's think quickly about how Gay presents herself to her audience. This isn't an academic paper, but it shows a lot of knowledge. Gay sweeps up a big audience by being both knowledgeable and relatable, by showing that she's both done research and had experiences. We don't have to look hard to see examples of this. The first paragraph demonstrates several things besides the interesting anecdote about the Spanish king who got his lips sewn shut. It shows off the bat that she's knowledgeable about grammar. It shows that she knows some expectations about how to incorporate her research into her own text. It shows that she's done that research. It also shows that she's relatable by using colloquial phrases such as, quote, he was so fat, unquote, and starting her narrative with a bit of dark humor. 
All of this has nothing to do with the actual facts related, but with how they are conveyed. The subtext is this. I know what I'm talking about, and I'm talking to you. And I don't think you're a stuffy academic or an ignorant fool. I think you're a person who might benefit from my story. With a few changes of words, she could go in either direction. This could easily become more academic or more casual. But this specific way of phrasing is fine-tuned for the broad, general, educated audience she's trying to reach. And all this work also offers her some cultural capital in that world. The sophisticated structure of this piece, that intermingling of the personal and the public we talked about before, the collection of themes regarding not just individual weight, but capitalism, body image, desire, and self-healing, all assume some sophistication in her audience. So for educated readers, these all signal her as one of us. And by doing so, she makes us deeply interested in and sympathetic toward what she has to say. These are markers of the culture this work comments on and critiques. It allows her to critique from within instead of without, and thus her arguments and her assaults on society's assumptions are especially effective.